I'm Jim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Greer, ER travel physician and former chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Caldwell Memorial Hospital. However, you probably know him better as the founder of both the Disclosure Project and Space Energy Access Systems, which have provided a ray of hope for millions of all science fans around the globe and brought the serious discussion of UFOs to the United States Congress. Both Disclosure and Keys are exemplary organizations. Disclosure has assembled a dream team of expertise to provide unparalleled, credible commentary on the truth behind the UFO phenomena, and Seed Power has assembled a cadre of investors to work on finding and funding the next big step in breakthrough energy technology. Well, let's start out with what I believe is one of your greatest achievements with the Disclosure Project, overcoming the giggle factor to build a solid collaboration spanning government, industry, and the body politic. My impression is that in an era of divisiveness, you've managed to build bridges to accomplish something unique. What are your current goals, and how is your work progressing? We're uh, putting out everything we had, the sources we had, for you, really the volunteer effort. We've really been restricted now, and we most of lack of staff and funding. But uh, at this point, we have a, uh, a really strong presence uh, uh, in Washington with a network of people who uh, follow what we're doing. You know, one of the things that I noticed uh, while doing research, I guess, in the interview, was how many belief systems there are. You know, I, I, I guess the thought that came to mind was, back in something like 1950, the public perception of UFOs was pretty homogenous. But, you know, now in 2005, we have a multitude of diverging belief systems about ET. I mean, the, the rumors include psychic aliens, aliens working at Area 51, aliens with Bermuda Triangle, hybrids, and... You know,
Thanksgiving, and as I said, that over the lawn about other secular things in Washington, uh, being in Washington a lot, but you kind of see this culture evolve, and yet what we've got to put together uh, a tremendous uh, network of uh, military intelligence corporate people who team this giant black triangle, larger than a football field, that passed so close overhead that I could count rivets on the hull. Now, in my case, I don't have an explanation for it, but it really did change my perspective. And I'm wondering, in your case, if there was a singular event like this that really shook your worldview, leading down the, the path that you're now taking. Well, yeah, it's a couple things. First, when I was a child, you know, my uncle was the senior project uh, engineer for the uh, lunar module. Thank 
that was studying the propulsion and uh, how these uh, so-called UFOs operated. They were called flying saucers back then, to be honest with you. Um, and these extraterrestrial vehicles were being studied. And a very, very high-profile team, all the very clandestine work was being done. It ended up by Dr. Anna or Bush, who also ended up, by the way, the Manhattan Project, a lot of the work with the development of the atomic weapon. Now, in this top secret document, it clearly states that the secrecy surrounding that project of studying how the UFOs are operating uh, is uh, more tightly held than the development of the hydrogen bomb. The reason that's significant is that the hydrogen bomb cannot be detonated at the time uh, that it is memo was written. And uh, so, uh, this top secret memo, and there are others like them that we've accumulated, we have uh, over 5,000 pages of government documents from the U.S., Canada, uh, the old KGB files, Maine, uh, all over the world, Great Britain. Uh, and it, it's a very interesting thing. Most people in the words of the environment, I go away in a thousand. <laughs> Which one do you want to look at? And it's interesting because but, but historically, what you need to do is then understand that the work, the early work that had been done by some scientists like Dean House and Brown and, and Dr. Greenfield and others uh, would merge in co very complex projects and mainly in the aerospace industry. Uh, a lot of these come work more for uh, later than the IC got involved with these things. Uh, Rand group uh, studying the physics behind the high voltage electrogramatic and magnetic gravitic uh, effects. Oh. And so there's no question that those projects are, are long standing. Now, the, the bad news, uh, in, in a sense, the good news is that we have figured out a lot of this. The, the bad news is that the, the group that's managing the secrecy around this has pretty much walked away from the interests of we the people. And this is where, where it gets into a very social and political crisis. Uh, just by the Howard warned us to wear the military industrial complex. And he wasn't referring to how you do his colleagues in the military. He was a vice for a general and a conservative Republican as the corporate kleptocracy that was going to get funding and the classification to run with this stuff and hide it. And we have one of his witnesses, Brigadier General uh, Lucy Lovkin, who was a young aide working with Eisenhower directly in the White House and witnessed how Eisenhower had been, quote, stabbed in the back and uh, had been betrayed by the adventure that he later warned us about on his last swan song feast of Asia in 1961. Sure. So I, I think people have to understand that there are, are extremely well developed uh, prototypes and, 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 and craft that are out there, many of which have been named by people like you and others, uh, that are man made uh, and that are, uh, if you will, anti gravity or electrogravitic and then deal with propulsion, dealing with uh, the neutralization of hand inertia. There's two things here, and I don't get this technical, but hand inertia and gravity, and they're not necessarily the same. Yeah. You have hand inertia out of the space where the person is gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. But these technologies handle that essentially. So an object up here to float or to be moving at an enormous speed and uh, make a right hand turn uh, without the, the occupant feeling it, uh, but it can be adjusted uh, Internally, for those uh, so called G forces that are, are controlled. The other thing is that they can um, appear to disappear. Now, this gets into a little stranger because if you take these the physics a little further, you can do, and this is my current track, where you actually, quote, dematerialize an object. And what that means is that the resonance stays with it and shifts it so that it's no longer in a frequency at the speed of light. And it, it just disappears. So you'll have a object there, and then it'll fade and move it on. And we have many, many accounts of this, both on radar, but very well-trained observers who think this. And our advanced uh, research team that's gone out all over the world to study this have seen this happen uh, many times, so out in the field and so well throughout the United States and so Latin America and England and, and uh, Belgium and other locations. Well, one, one thing that I've been wondering about, actually this is a little, well, I, I guess a little bit of a change from the questions that I've written to myself, but I had a discussion with a few friends who we were talking about, um, you know, the talk of UFOs, and one of the questions that came up was, why are they here now? And the only idea that we could think of, and I think this touches back to your comments about it being more secret than the bomb, was the detonation of nuclear bombs and, and then subsequent testing in 45 through the 50s. Well, I have had one top secret military, and I mean, these are people with the Q clearances and more of the Q clearances, if you get my drift, uh, folks who, who have told me absolutely that that's the case. I've had British intelligence and ministers and then people tell me the same thing in Great Britain, that the big surge in interest in, in humanity, whether or not there's an ancient connection, or whether or not the NASA lines, or whether or not the, you know, there's some, some uh, cave drawings from France that date back thousands of years of what was purported to be UFOs. You know, it's hard to prove that because you're going so far back in time, and the history and the record is not good. 
what we have in the monitor is clearly a huge uh, resurgence um, of interest in Earth and I think the human race at the time that we developed weapons of mass destruction and began to explore space. Remember, those two events were on a very parallel track. That our ability to detonate the nuclear weapons in the 40s and 50s was also the beginning of the space era, of course, which my family was involved with. And, and, and what you find is that uh, the combination of those two things, logically, and I think it's not like far here, but I mean, just look at it logically and dispassionately from the eyes of civilization, not human, but out in space watching it develop. All of a sudden, you have these uh, this murderous civilization that's killed tens of millions of our own people in warfare, developing weapons that can destroy entire planets, right? Okay, if you were to destroy an entire planet. Um, with thousands of them all aimed at each other in a policy of mutual assured destruction, and we're going out into space. Well, I mean, you know, you have to be galactically brain dead, not to take notice of this and be concerned. And I believe that, yes, yeah, this is really what triggered it. And I mean, it isn't because they are hostile towards us, but that they're concerned with our hostility. And what I found is that in all likelihood, if we were to ever to figure out how to live peacefully on this planet, and I should add, go out into space peacefully as opposed to competing nations with our weapons and so. Um, I believe that we would find a very welcome uh, uh, and open arm response. However, I think so long as we remain on uh, war footing and where the military industrial complex is controlling the agenda in space and also controlling the agenda on Earth, I think that you're going to find a more cautious approach to the human situation. And I think this makes sense because, frankly, uh, our technology has now stripped our social and spiritual development in, in a way that at this age is very dangerous. Because we're not dealing with muskets and rifles and, you know, uh, things like this. We're dealing with, with, with weapon systems uh, that even move beyond nuclear, by the way, into the so-called scalar uh, system that can be a threat to other civilizations. And I think that this is why one of the biggest challenges, and I say this to people, uh, when I gave a lecture at the United Nations and Mrs. Boudreaux's Bali had invited me on to come to the wife of the Secretary General and uh, a whole lot of high profile people at this meeting. I said, uh, you know, the title of the talk was The Foundations of Interplanetary Peace. And this was the topic of this discussion that, that uh, while there was no evidence at all to see civilizations uh, of extraterrestrial origin are hostile towards us, they're very concerned with our ability to destroy ourselves and perhaps also to destroy the world, and that we are going to have to evolve past that sort of uh, uh, shall I say, a, a backward way of, of behavior uh, before we're going to be welcomed too far out of space. And, and I do honestly believe uh, that we have had our, um, I hate to use the word quarantine, but to a certain extent, I think our ability to go out into space, even with some of these advanced uh, technologies we've developed in classified projects, is limited because they know that we're not socially, spiritually, or otherwise psychologically mature enough to do this without uh, it trying to go out there in a way that it could be a threat to, uh, to, 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 to other civilizations. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think that this makes sense. I, and I do believe that that's why the 40s, 50s, and forward were, were so, so prominent in terms of people seeing uh, UFOs, and they were very often seen around nuclear facilities. Well, you know, I, I'd like to quickly touch on some of the, the repeated claims, and I guess we could call these mythology, maybe. I don't know if they're true or fiction. Yeah, right. Um, yes, so they were. Yeah, you know, it, it, I think part of it has been that the entire thing has gone on for so long that it's all become part of our popular mythology, part of our popular vernacular. But um, in this case, bismuth and mercury pop up again and again, being involved with not only UFOs, but also all sorts of gravity research projects. And I, I haven't seen any hard and fast speculation other than supposedly bismuth acts like a condenser for gravitational effects, and then mercury is repeatedly cited in Nazi Bell, uh, Edgar Fouché's TR3D, and even the ancient Vimana text. I, I wonder if you've seen anything that might lend some idea as to why these keep popping back up. Well, there are certain materials, and those are two you mentioned that, uh, that have been associated with, I think, some of the more primitive uh, gravity wave or anti-gravity research. I think the more advanced ones uh, deal with uh, electronics that are not as dependent on those materials. Does that make any sense? Oh, okay. 
Okay, so these, these are really kind of the baseline that's moved forward since then, but that probably has to niche back out into the mythology yet. So. Well, and same thing with some of the energy research we've seen. We've seen people doing research on uh, crystalline structures where a certain electronic signal goes into a crystalline structure, and the resonance of, the, of that uh, crystal will then recruit energy from what Back in the 60s, 
Donald Denzel was the guy that he met at Harvard and thought, oh, this is all nonsense. Well, I have a document hanging down as one of their advisors on it. He was taking money. He was, a, he was presenting himself to the scientific community as a dispassionate scientist when he was a corrupt shill for the, this kleptocracy of covert program taking money through the back door through the agency. This is not contested. It's a document I have in hand. The same with the Condon Report. There was at the University of Colorado that debunked all this. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Wood and also documents that I've acquired prove for a fact that Dr. Condon, who presented himself as a dispassionate scientist over there and told the truth about what UFOs really are, and he came out with this completely debunking whitewash report that proves all of it, he was on the payroll of the agency, and I have a document in him. So what you find is that you have people in academia, in corporations and in government who present themselves as sterling scientists and legitimate people who then go to the press or go to scientific gatherings and poo-poo all of this. But these people are utterly corrupt, and we prove this. So this corruption is really the name of the game. And unfortunately, the masses uh, don't get the benefit of what the truth is now. The flip side of that is that they really lost, they won some of those battles, but they won the war. And here's what I mean. More than half of America believe that there's something to these UFOs and that the government's hiding us and are lying about it. And that's a consistent number. So more people think that this stuff is real than voted for any of the recent presidents, none of whom have really gotten over 50% of the, of the, of the electorate. So what we find is that, uh, they, they, they try to keep this contained, but they contain it from uh, not so much the masses, but they try to contain it from polite society, what you would call your prestigious scientific institutions and media. For example, the New York Times has and today's policy of redlining anything about UFOs. They will not report anything on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why. Um, you know, here the disclosure project puts together not two or three sources, but dozens of top secret insiders in government. And I'm sitting there briefing a sitting CIA director on this stuff, and the New York Times refuses to hold a, to have one story about it. So you have to understand that the big media is the only thing in our society more corrupt than the big corporate and, and government world. The big media is the most corrupt institution in America. Oh, I, you know, that's, that's why I'm wondering if I'm as helpful to pursue as a civil rights issue in terms of, you know, again, I mean, discrimination against people, you know, we're not allowed to do it on the basis of race, gender, religion, or a variety of factors. And yet, if someone says, you know, I believe in this event, I believe in this, to, you know, to be truthful, and, uh, you know, they could get fired from their job, they can lose well, yeah, their we have a pilot who's a 777 pilot uh, for a major airline who was being threatened with being sat down because he was uh, uh, on his team of one of these objects but was involved with our project. Uh, and, uh, and that actually almost went to litigation. And if they back down, of course, and he's still flying at 777. But uh, you also remember the, the Japan Airlines event that happened over Alaska that we have a top secret uh, document for. And uh, uh, John Callahan, who was head of the FAA, uh, gave us the radar tape. Uh, he was head of the uh, accident investigation section of the FAA, I should say. And he gave us the radar tape for this event. Well, that pilot, the Japanese Airlines pilot who first reported it, was put down uh, and not allowed to fly for a month or two until uh, Dr. Richard Haynes at NASA, who, who I've worked with for years, who collected many, uh, over, I don't know, a couple thousand of these uh, pilot reports, went forward and uh, uh, went over to with the Japanese uh, peak government and the airline and said, look, this man was not hallucinating. These things are real. Here's the evidence for it. So there have been some cases like that. It's interesting. They don't fill into the major media much, but uh, I would say that anyone who has um, uh, been denied uh, a job or has been discriminated against because of their involvement in this uh, should actually litigate it. But we would be happy to have our witnesses be read. And one of the things we're looking for is a venue so that all these top secret people we've identified can testify under oath. And if the Congress doesn't have the courage to do it, then a uh, a civil tort case that could do it. Oh, so, sure. <laughs> so I would say that anyone who's, who's suffered something like that legitimately uh, should should pursue it. Well, and, and speaking of involvement, I'd actually like to wrap up our interview with 
I guess, the big question of how can people get involved, how, how they can contribute, and how they can get their friends and relatives to kind of solve information so that they can form an educated opinion about this topic. Um, well, I think the best way is, is for the educate yourself. You know, our, our website, uh, disclosureproject.org, uh, has video footage people can see, the two-hour um, national press event uh, that will cover on CNN and, and networks all over the world um, of uh, these uh, copies of military people speaking. Uh, we have a book called Disclosure that has almost 600 pages that has uh, nearly 70 of these uh, military and intelligence corporate people testifying to what they had seen. Um, we have a, a two-hour and a four-hour video tape of their testimony that's very thorough. Um, and these are things that are openly available to the public. Uh, anyone can uh, get it from our website, disclosureproject.org. Uh, and they can refer their friends and colleagues and families to that. And I encourage them to. The other thing they can do is help us identify more of these sort of uh, whistleblowers and people who work in these settings. Because we, uh, we're always looking for, for new uh, sources. We have uh, uh, an ongoing project to identify these important witnesses. And I think the other thing is that uh, there are people out there who are aware of the technologies of, of uh, energy or propulsion devices that perhaps they've worked on or tinkered with. And we have a separate uh, corporate effort right now uh, trying to develop a uh, energy device, uh, energy or propulsion device that proves the physics behind uh, what people have observed. And so anyone who can help us with that, I would encourage them to contact us. Okay, and that would be the C Power website at seaspower.com, uh, right? Okay, so disclosureproject.org or seaspower.com. Well, thank you again for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. It's been a wonderful opportunity to cover kind of a unique subject matter. Um, with, you know, the recognized expert in the field. Well, thank you. I appreciate your help. Thanks again.